So welcome. There is so much going on here this morning. It's just a regular busy Sunday morning at St. John's. Today we enjoy visits from old friends. So Père Milor, who is from St. Etienne's Church in Haiti, we pray for them every week. This is his second visit to be with us. So welcome, Père Milor. And as you probably saw, welcome as well to new friends. Uh, as it turns out, Alistair So, our new associate, this is his first Sunday joining us. He's over getting training from our young people <laughs> in the children's chapel. So be sure he'll be back and be sure to welcome him. We're really excited. We have a special guest with us today, Doug Zook. So Doug, raise your hand. Doug is from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Akron, Ohio. They indeed are a church that joins us in partnership with St. Etienne's in Haiti. And so Doug has come to spend some time with us because Pair Milor will go there next week, but Doug's in charge of their Haiti ministry and he wasn't gonna be there next weekend, so he just drove on over yesterday. So we're really happy you're with us, Doug. So greet Doug afterwards and at coffee hour. And gosh, animals awaiting. We saw a few being walked around, you know, outside. So uh, the yearly blessing at the Lich Gate is gonna happen after this service. And some of you, as always happens, are a little late coming in from our fabulous 10 o'clock adult forum, looking at both grotesque and humorous stories from Flannery O'Connor. Uh, and then coffee hour, gosh, uh, it follows here. And for those of you who often will greet one of your clergy there at the crossing and then make sort of the fast exit left to your car in the parking lot, you know who you are. And it's okay, we, it's totally fine, except I want to say that when you don't come over to the parish house, you miss some things that are going on. I mean, there's a lot to miss. You could be picking up your very own fruit and granola bars, uh, to keep in your car. They have a little tag on them from Voices Rise and, and offering a free lunch at Paul's Place. These can be in your car so that when you pull to the end of Expressway and you encounter someone who's homeless, you can give them a little bit to eat and invite them to either sing or to have some food. So they're there, right there, I promise. If you just breeze in, you'll find them. Or you could sign up for the 5K Run Walk and be on our team. For, to raise money for Paul's Place down in Pigtown on November the 10th, where we're gonna walk and run together as a team and as families. You also could stop and pick up these mini prayer shawls. Some of you know these come from our ministry in God's hands, and particularly for yourself or for another, it's a nice way to let someone know that God is near and that we're praying for them. They're just the size that fit in a pocket or a purse. Now, if you're looking for some things to help you with your daily meditations, forward day by day. If you're getting old and your eyesight is failing, we've got large copies for you. <laughs> and if you're plenty young and need something that fits in your pocket or your purse, this is the forward day-by-day -day meditations for November, December, and January. I mean you're missing it, right? Um, you could also pick up our new brochures that outline our Music in the Valley concerts. So you too can see the groups that will be coming. Take this home and make sure to show up starting tonight at our first Music in the Valley concert. And then, if you haven't figured this out before, to support two of our outreach ministries, you too could buy Direct Trade Haitian Coffee. And so support our work in Haiti where the farmers and the growers that are up at St. Etienne's have the benefit of instruction from the folks at Singing Rooster Coffee. Now if you've been to Haiti, raise your hand if you have, you'll know the Singing Rooster like the roosters get you up, only they, their clocks are off and it's usually like 3 a.m., not at dawn. In addition, there are a lot of things you can buy from, um, from the Thistle Farms Ministry that we support down in Nashville, Tennessee, where they help women who have been trafficked get off the streets and find ways to support themselves. So, there's a lot going on and there's a lot to see, touch, feel, and purchase. <laughs> 
So we're not a large church, but we do live large on the foundation that we have inherited, pursuing joyfully the opportunities that God provides for community and outreach, caring for those who worship among us and those who are our neighbors near and far, sharing our buildings with partners and programs in ministry as much as we are able. Each Sunday we have approximately 110 people who come here and sit in the pews and worship with us. And like most mainline denominations, the constitution of that group varies each week. Whereas regular attendance at church 50 and 75 years ago meant that you were there every Sunday. In fact, so much so that if someone was sitting, were sitting in your seat, you would be a little miffed. Now, a regular churchgoer who finds his or her way through our doors comes about once a month. But church, like most things in life, reflects the axiom, the more you put in, the more you get out. And yet, you know, there's this funny twist about Christianity. With God's love, the output is always there. Secretly, even if you only put in a little, God is there. God is constant. God's love is hovering in the gentlest of ways, waiting for a moment, an intersection to reveal itself and inspire us. We hope that God, St. John's Church is a place for you of God's presence and an inspiration for you and your family. We hope that this is the place wherein these moments of intersection with God's love may be captured. And we hope that you will take advantage of the numerous gifts and graces open to you through your active participation in the life of St. John's. The free gift of God's love is meant to emanate from everything we do. Now, in our fast-paced lives, that's not a stretch of the imagination, is it? In our fast-paced lives, I mean, we have octogenarians and nonagenarians who are still traveling overseas in this parish. On extended families, for many of us, live far away, and it requires a different kind of attention than maybe 50 and 75 years ago. Most young families have two working parents and maybe only slightly over-programmed children. <laughs> With our devices like our cell phones and our iPads, we can use apps and Facebook and Instagram to connect with each other and stay in touch. But I would like to say, in these times, there is some wisdom in, in having the experience of real community, that it becomes pretty important. Sitting next to someone in the pew, discussing theology, in a class together. Children learning our seminal stories in chapel and in Sunday school, performing them at Christmas and Easter so that those stories sink deep into their bones and lodge in their psyches. Sipping some Haitian coffee at coffee hour around those tables, eating some good snacks, sometimes even letting those snacks substitute for lunch, rehearsing and singing songs together that will, will be offered in worship, songs that touch the soul, whether we are children or adults, sharing a holy meal right here, which we will do just a little later, praying for those whom we love who are struggling, remembering those who have died. Now, I know I am literally preaching to the choir on this, but I think our Sunday mornings together matter, that our shared experiences can make a difference and have the potential to transform our lives. In fact, that's the theme of this year's annual appeal, transforming generosity, continuing to make a difference. Now, I have to tell you, I said to someone this week, I feel a little bit like Rhea Fiken. Do y'all know who Rhea Fiken is? She's that lady I, I bet you know her face and her voice on local public television, on Maryland public television, that you know every time there's a campaign, she's the one standing up and telling you how great it is and what you ought to do. 
I'm reminding myself of some of the harangers on WBJC or WYPR. I feel like I need to make a pitch and remind you of what I suspect you already know, and then push you to make a contribution or to increase your contribution using incentive gifts and a little bit of fact and a little bit of guilt and a little bit of loyalty and a little bit of inspiration. And actually, I'm not too shy about doing that. I believe that, that what we do here, who we are and how we are with each other and the way we offer ourselves in prayer and caring, the joy we find together, the way we move beyond our walls to a wider world, loving as God loved us, I think we are a good group by God's grace and with some financial help that will continue. So our collect this morning, that beginning prayer, acknowledges that God is always, always ready and willing to give. The prayer asks that God, asks that God bless us with an abundance of mercy for giving us where necessary. In the prayer, we ask God to give us the good things that in humility we dare not ask because we know ourselves as unworthy, but knowing also that we are worthy because of God's great gift in Jesus Christ for us. It is in that spirit, it, with this posture of both humility and confidence, that I invite your participation in our annual appeal campaign. So a word of wisdom from the Old Testament lesson in Job. You know, our gifts from God are never about what we deserve. Although it is so tempting to equate our faithfulness with God's blessing. So you know what I mean by that? So we either have a lot of blessings and we assume that we must be good with God. or. Um, we work really hard to be faithful, and then we expect God to sort of do better with us, right? So Job, in the Old Testament, was righteous in God's eyes and deserved only good, and yet, in this reading that we heard, his blessings are about to be undone. How many of us here, if we dare to admit it to ourselves, at one time or another, have attempted to really live faithfully and been caught wondering, about the faithfulness of God that we have not received the blessing that we have hoped or prayed for. Faith, as it intersects our real lives, is complex. Is it not our reality that sometimes faithfulness yields blessings, other times not so much, and sometimes even suffering? And sometimes it simply matters where you were born. Now, I'm going to give you an example from Haiti, but I could give you an example from almost any other country in, uh, on the face of the planet, and certainly from our own city, Baltimore. If you had been born in Episcopalian in the mountains above Laogon in Haiti, so much about your life would be the same as it is now. You'd be, have the same intelligence, the same hopes and dreams. You'd be worshiping the same church, the same community spirit would surround you but you would not have the same financial resources and probably not the same educational opportunities. There very, very likely would be many days when you or your family were literally hungry. It's nice to say those words, but hunger so that your stomach cramps and is in knots for lack of food. It's just a regular occurrence among the regular par parishioners at St. Etienne's. Sometimes it does simply matter where you were born. If we were honest with ourselves and each other, it would be hard for any of us to participate in the politics of grievance, of stoking the fires of resentment about what we do not have. We would understand that of all the places in the world, we are incredibly blessed to be born in the United States. Of all the eras within which to live, we are incredibly lucky to be living now. 
You know, this week we had a funeral for Rufus Williams, an 87-year-old who lived down the road who died recently. And he had his first heart surgery over 40 years ago. In any other place, in any other age, he would not have lived to 87. The unusual part about Rufus was that he seemed to know how fortunate he was. He lived with a lot of playfulness and a lot of joy and not much fuss. It was wonderful to behold. That is the kind of transformed lives that God invites us to. Lives lived in gratitude, lives lived in playfulness and joy, lives lived with some measure of abandonment, some level of giving up, giving up our need for control or giving up our need to control or to hold on to our assets. Lives live generously in the full understanding that we have been given much and much needs to be shared. So that is why we try here at St. John's to be generous, generous, to say yes and yes and yes to every opportunity to share what we have and to make a difference. Now more than ever, I think we need this message. We need to remind each other. We need to challenge each other. You know, we're kind of a competitive group. Oh, that we could have a competition for who could outgive the other in giving to the church. So today, and for the next four weeks, I urge you to consider prayerfully and playfully your financial commitments to St. John's. Each year our expenses go up, and in spite of a very robust capital campaign a few years ago, we are always challenged. That is the nature of nonprofits and churches. We function in the context of faith and hope, and here in the church each fall, we hope that the upfront commitments for the coming year will actually be able to sustain our operations during that year. It is by its very nature a risk. In this day and age, when the mechanisms for giving may prevent folks from making upfront gifts because there are special ways that your company will only release funds at the end of a year, now more than ever, we need people's generosity and planning. We need you, if that is the case, to consider your year-end gifts as well. Unlike the profit world, our goal is not to make money, but we still need money. Our goal is to be faithful in fulfilling the promise we make as Christians to bring the reconciling love of God in Jesus Christ to a world in need. Our bishop said that the church is the only institution founded to serve non-members. We are faithful when we take up this service, and your contributions are key. So let this month be a month of reflection for all of us about what we have been given. And I pray that for each of us, we will actually have the courage to consider what we actually need, and then what we are called in gratitude to give and give away. I really do hope that your confidence in our mission and ministry here at St. John's will lead you to give away much to this church. It's a really good investment, and your generosity will be contagious and maybe even transform your life, but for sure, will continue to transform the life of this church. Amen.